Does everyone have a copy lectures on faith? Rachel, you got one? You need one? You want to borrow one? No? You're not going to read for us today? I can barely talk this morning. That's all right. I'm just giving you a hard time. No. But I'll tell you what, I got an extra, so why don't you, you can go ahead and borrow it if you'd like. Hey, you got one? You all set? You're good? Okay. Ryan, would you mind going and saying a prayer and get us started? Thanks, sir. Heavenly Father, thank you again for letting us get out in your house this day. And Father, I'd ask that your spirit be with us as a class this day as we learn about the lectures of faith and continue to broaden our knowledge of what you want us to know. These things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you, sir. All right, we are ready to start on Lecture 7. It's the last of the lectures uh, in the Lectures on Faith. Um, and it's a um, <clears throat> basically a wrap up uh, of the rest of them, and uh, but again, good good to to go through and good to study. All right. So, has anybody last week we finished up six? Six talks about uh, sacrifice and um, uh, basically that that thing that we need to be willing to do with everything in our lives in order to uh, serve God, in order to um, uh, to truly um, be in, uh, fully under His power and to fully be able to exercise our faith in Him. And so just a quick quick review. Um, in six, Lecture 6, uh, verse 7, okay, it kind of wraps that whole thing up and, and states it in a perfunctory package. So if you're in the black book, it's page 86. Uh, it says, 7a, let us here observe that a religion did, that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. For from the first existence of man, the faith necessary unto the enjoyment of life and salvation never could be obtained without the sacrifice of all earthly things. Okay? It was through this sacrifice and this only that God has ordained that men should enjoy eternal life. And uh, remember, the, the reason for that is, is that we can never, if we are not willing to fully um, immerse ourselves in the faith, uh, in faith, all faith toward our Heavenly Father, uh, basically to rely upon Him for all things, to uh, totally give up all our, our um, personal wants and personal um, objectives in this world, and basically to let go of the things of the world, to open our grasp and let go of all those things. If we are not willing to do that, then we cannot have faith necessary to uh, inherit celestial glory, to, to bring about all faith, and, and, and really to trust in, in, in God fully and completely. Okay, Does that make sense? So that's what this requires. That's what this gospel and the doctrine of Jesus Christ requires, is our willingness to give it all up if we are asked to do so, even to our own lives, even to the lives of our children, if we had to. I'm not talking about sacrificing, you know, you know, us literally sacrificing them, but if the Lord calls for their lives, allowing that to happen. Okay. Think about uh, the Book of Mormon story. I've brought it up a couple times already, and I can never get the, the, the two men right. I think it was Abinadi and, and um, Amulek. And... Uh, and I may be wrong on those names, but but it was in that general time period. Remember, they uh, it was under King Noah, and uh, they, the, the men were preaching, and the believers were rounded up by by the the king's men, and they were killed. I, I believe they were all burned. And the two were um, standing there watching this, and uh, <clears throat> they, you know, the one turns to the other and says, "Let us call down fire from heaven, or or you know, judgment basically upon these people who are doing this." And the other says, "No, the Spirit constraineth me to allow this to happen." And the reason for that was because it set those people up as, as martyrs. It sealed their testimony in the faith and sealed the, point, the fact that they were willing to sacrifice all. And it serves as a testimony against those men who were killing them you know, in the, for their eternal judgment. So sometimes we are called upon to walk through the fire, literally. Okay, So... 
it, it comes to a point sometimes, you know, we, we don't like to think about that because it's kind of scary, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it may come to a point where we have to sacrifice our own, even our own lives, you know, all those things. So, uh, you have a book, you got your lectures on faith or you need one? Okay. Let me know if you need one. I got an extra. All right. So any, uh, questions, concerns, comments before we move on to lecture seven? Okay, good deal. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and go on to Lecture 7. So the first paragraph, I'll go ahead and read that. It's just a couple, couple little sentences. 1A in Lecture 7, In the preceding lectures, we treated of what faith was and of the object upon which it rested. Agreeable to our plan, we now proceed to speak of its effects. So, again, an introduction. You know, verse 1 is typically an introduction to, to the sections. And, but now it tells us what we're going to do. We've already we, we've looked at, at, at what the character, attributes, perfections of God. We've looked at the Godhead. We've looked at what the doctrine of Christ requires of us. Okay, all those things, and now we're going to proceed to speak of the effects of that faith that, that we need to have. Okay, Chuck, you guys need a copy of lectures on faith? You guys have one? Okay, we're on lecture seven. Anybody else? You guys good? Okay, would she like to borrow one? I've got an extra, so okay. Figure somebody back there has to need one, right? There you go. All right, we're on number seven, just starting, okay? So would someone like to read uh, two, verse two for us? Uh, Denise, do that. Eileen, we'll catch you later. Go ahead and do the whole, th well, when Ryan gets here, do the whole thing, A through H. As we have seen in our former lectures that faith was the principle of action and of power in all intelligent beings, both in heaven and on earth, it will not be expected that we will learn we will, in a lecture of this description, attempt to unfold all its effects. Neither is it necessary to our purpose so to do. For it would embrace all things in heaven and on earth and encompass all the creations of God with all their endless varieties. For no world has yet been framed that was not framed by faith. Neither has there been an intelligent being on any of God's creations who did not get there by reason of faith as it existed in himself or in some other being. Nor has there been a change or a revolution in any of the creations of God, but it has been affected by faith. Neither will there be a change or a revolution unless it is affected in the same way in any of the vast creations of the Almighty. For it is by faith that the deity works. Okay. Uh, so, uh, a couple, couple cases in point going back to earlier lectures. Lecture 1, okay, so that 2A there, as we've seen in former lectures, that faith was the principle of action, power of all intelligent beings. If we look at Lecture 1, Question 6, okay, and it states, How do you prove that faith is a principle of action in all intelligent beings? First, duly considering the operations of my own mind, and second, by the direct declaration of Scriptures. And the Scriptures are from Hebrews. Where's Hebrews? Right back about there. Nope, a little further. Nope, a little further up. There we go. Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, starting with verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And again, by acting on that faith, he built the ark, and by that showing forth what, what God was telling him, not just preaching to the people for that 120 years and telling them all oh, the end's coming, but actually moving forward in faith, building this ark for something that he had never seen, this huge flood coming that he had never seen, uh, he condemned the world because of that, because they just laughed and ridiculed him and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, was that seven? Eight. Uh, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Okay, and again in uh, verse 27. Same chapter, Hebrews 11. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And actually, if you go through basically that whole chapter, it, it proves the point. Okay, obviously, they're talking about Moses and that last one there. 
So that's how you prove it. First, duly considering the operations of my own mind, and second, by the direct declaration of scriptures, that faith is the principle of action in all intelligent beings. And then again in lecture one, question seven, is not faith the principle of action in spiritual things as well as in temporal? It is, easy answer, but going on to question eight, how do you prove it? And there's a number of scriptures, Hebrews 11.6, Mark 16.16, 16, and Romans 4.16 in that. Okay, and I don't think we need to go through the rest of those. You guys can, can uh, do that on your own. Okay, and then of course the rest of uh, verse 2 there uh, is talking about uh, going back over the same things that we've discussed previously in the last few weeks about how uh, uh, no world was yet framed that was not framed by faith, uh, neither was there an intelligent being uh, on any of God's creations. You did not get there by reason of faith and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, okay, and then, and then H there. Uh, is another another proof text here, for it is by faith that the deity works. If we look back at lecture one, and go to fifteen, I call it verse fifteen. Uh, fifteen through seventeen a uh, shows this. Okay, so by this we understand that the principle of power which existed in the bosom of God, by which the worlds were framed, was faith, and that and that it is by reason of this principle of power existing in the deity that he, all created things exist, so that all things in heaven, on earth, or under the earth exist by reason of faith as it existed in Him. Had it not been for the principle of faith, the worlds n would never have been framed; neither would man have been formed of the dust. It is the principle by which Jehovah works and through which he exercises power over all temporal as well as eternal things. Take this principle or attribute, for it is an attribute from the deity, and he would cease to exist. Who cannot see that if God framed the worlds by faith, that it is by faith that he exercises power over them, and that faith is the principle of power? All right. Okay, so that's, those are some of the proof texts and some of the things to review what, what we've talked about. Okay, questions, comments there? Okay, let's move on to three. Eileen, would you read three uh, for us? A through G. Eileen, yeah, she's over there. Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> uh, she kind of blends into the background sometimes. So. <laughs> it's like a pew. <laughs> Did you want the whole, the whole thing? Yeah, all of three, please. Okay. Um, let us here offer some explanation in relation to faith that our meaning may be clearly uh, comprehended. We ask then, what are we to understand by a man's working by faith? We answer, we understand that when a man works by faith, he works by mental exertion instead of physical force. It is by words instead of exerting his physical powers uh, with which every being works when he works by faith. God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's Genesis. Joshua spake, and the great lights which God had <coughs> created stood still. Elijah commanded, and the heavens were stayed for the space of uh, three years and six months so that it did not rain. He again commanded, and the heavens gave forth rain. All this was done by faith, and the Savior says, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto the mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall, re and it shall remove. Or if you might say unto this uh, sic sycamine tree, uh, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, it should uh, obey you. Faith then works by words and uh, with these, its mightiest works have been and will be performed. All right. Thank you, Eileen. So um, 3A, starting you know, with that last sentence there, we ask then, what are we to understand by a man's working by faith? We answer, we understand that when a man works by faith, he works by mental exertion instead of physical force. So... Um, well, let me finish that. It is by words, instead of exerting his physical powers, with which every being works when he works by faith. Okay? So, so faith is a... Exerting faith is, is more of a, a mental exercise. Okay? Obviously, it's a belief, right? And remember earlier in the lectures, it was probably in lecture one, I don't remember exactly which one, but it says faith and doubt cannot exist in the same being at the same time. Okay, so going on, in, you know, further down, I, th I think the point 
that point is, is somewhat proved. There's, uh, there's two aspects to this. In, in 3E and in 3F, it talks about if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, hence, or remove hence to yonder place and shall remove. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, anything that we do or say by faith, I think God has to approve of it and it has to be His will that it be done. Okay? But it also, if, if uh, you know, this is just my opinion and what I see, you know, from myself and, and, and us in general in the church is doubt definitely exists in, in our minds. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're stepping out in faith. And we, we've, I think each of us has probably had testimonies where we've done that and the Lord has provided for us, you know, uh, not, not to the extent of maybe moving a mountain or plucking up a sycamore tree and planting it in, a, in an ocean. And things of that nature. We look at that as the big, big, as big miracles, right? <laughs> big things. Whereas, you know, if it, but at the same time, every miracle is a big miracle, okay? Just like every sin is a big sin, you know, it doesn't matter. We, we classify the size of these things. So, um, just because we hope for something to happen or pray for something to happen, if it doesn't happen, we, we that we can't let that, um, yeah, de degrade our faith. Okay, that, that just wasn't God's will for those things to happen. Okay, uh, but we have to have have that that faith. I mean, we see with the brother of Jared that he he commanded a mountain to move, and then the mountain moves that so they had a pathway to go through. I mean, we see this time and again through the scriptures. You know, it's an interesting thing too. Is <clears throat> We, we look at the, the ministry of Christ, and he had about a three, three and a half year ministry, right? Okay, but he, it states somewhere that not even a hundredth of the things that he taught and, and did are recorded. So we have some major highlights, we have some highlights, but we don't have everything. So we don't know everything that went on, you know, with his ministry. We don't know all the encounters he had. We don't know all the miracles that were performed. And I would say that's probably true of the apostles. Because we have very little writings of the apostles, right? The, the original 12 apostles with Christ. And we have very little uh, uh, historical accounts of, of those things. So, and he told them that you will go on to do even, even uh, uh, greater miracles than I have performed and so on and so forth. And uh, so, you know, just, just thinking what we have, and that's in, in the scriptures, and that's all that can happen, and that's all that ever did happen, that's false thinking too. So we know that, that, that we have to exercise our faith, and we have to continue to improve it, and work on it, and go forth, and even when we get beaten down, or things don't go the way we want to, uh, we can't chalk that up to, to uh, uh, a lack of God existing or being there. We have to chalk that up to either it wasn't His will, or I better examine my faith and, and doubt you know, uh, uh, aspect, ratio in my mind, okay? Yeah. Wouldn't that work also when we're saying negative things in the other way? To be careful what we say. I, I know I take that as a, like, be careful what you say, mm -hmm. because sometimes, you know, we're saying break my neck or all those kinds of words like that. Maybe we shouldn't be using them either because they're going the other way. I was just thinking that, you, mean thinking you know, when you say things just positive? without like, well, what I'm thinking is Give some me an people, example. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm okay, an example think I'm following is, you, but I want to make sure. Okay, example is um, you're a pain in the neck <laughs> or, or, or I'll kill you. You know, you've heard yes, people say yes, that. Yes. And they don't mean they're going to kill you. Right. But they're just saying it. I'm thinking that maybe that, that also means be careful on the other end. I if agree. words are important to create things, words could damage. I'm yeah. just thinking that. And, and they, they can, absolutely. And that's, you know, that's where we have to be careful, you know, as, as with what we have and what we are supposed to understand, as we have to be very careful in how we use our words and how we speak to people. And I'm not very careful to be the first to admit that. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I haven't used that phrase, I'm going to kill you in a long time. Um, I've, used, I've used the phrase, I'd like to kill you, but <laughs> uh, not that that's good either. But... Um, but, uh, you know, and, but, but yeah, we have to be careful on those things because, you know, for, for the simple fact of witnessing, but also um, for the simple fact, of, uh, the other simple fact of what it, it puts in our minds and, and, and the path that it leads us down to thinking. So instead, of, it takes us off that, that path of, of uh, seeking after Christ and puts us on a, another path of, of more of a, um, 
I want to say a physical aspect, a temporal, temporal aspect of, of worrying about our wants and our needs versus, yeah, somebody may be running you down. Somebody may be uh, really a pain in the neck. Somebody may be, you know, uh, doing something to you, but instead of going to God, we're thinking, boy, I'd like to wring their little necks or do whatever the case may be. And, and yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. That's, that's uh, something that, that I need to work on and probably most of us need to work on would be my guess is that uh, we need to uh, be careful with our words and, and try to be more like a duck and let the water run off our back, you know, type of thing. Because it, it doesn't matter in the long run. Yeah, how we're being persecuted and stuff doesn't matter so long as we are keeping an eye single to God's glory and working toward His ultimate goal. Okay, the establishment of Zion on earth and our inheritance in this celestial kingdom. So, anyone else? Okay, so let's go ahead and move on from there then. Um, if we could have someone read 4 and 5, verses 4 and 5. Uh, Steve in the back. It surely will be required of us to prove that this is the principle upon which all eternity has acted and will act. For every reflecting mind must know that it is by reason of this power that all the hosts of heaven perform their works of wonder, <laughs> majesty, and glory. Angels move from place to place by virtue of this power. It is by this reason, it is by reason of it that they are enabled to descend from heaven to earth. And were it not for the power of faith, they never should be ministering spirits to them who should be heirs of salvation. Neither could they act as heavenly messengers. For they would be destitute of the power necessary to enable them to do the will of God. It is only necessary for us to say that the whole visible creation as it now exists is the effect of faith. It was faith by which it was framed. And it is by the power of faith that it continues in its organized form and by which the planets move round their orbits and sparkle forth their glory. So then faith is truly the first principle in the science of theology and when understood leads the mind back to the beginning and carries it forward to the end. For in other words, from eternity to eternity. All right. Thank you, Steve. All righty. So uh, 4A about, you know, most of the way down there uh, states, It is by reason of this power, meaning the power of faith, that all the hosts of heaven perform their works of wonder, uh, majesty, and glory. If, 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 if they did not have faith, even the hosts of heaven, and being in the presence of the Father, knowing that He exists, knowing of His power, they still have to believe that, that what He asks them to do and, and what they are doing for Him will work, you know, will occur. Otherwise, why go forth and do it, right? And uh, so it, it's by that reason of faith, even the faith and the knowledge that they have, but it's by that reason of faith that they are able to perform uh, their works of wonder, majesty, and glory. Okay, so just think, um, you know, the same here for us. It is by reason of our faith that we show up here on Sunday morning, right? Okay, it is by reason of our faith that we think this is important, that we believe this is important to be here in church, to, uh, uh, to, to fellowship with, with those of, of like faith and understanding and knowledge. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's by reason of faith that, that we, we sit and listen to whoever's going to be standing up here talking, um, by reason of faith that we call upon the elders for administration because we believe there's something there. You know, it's by reason of faith. And, 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 and by that faith, we allow God to work. We allow our Lord and Savior to work through those ministers who are authorized ministers uh, uh, of Him hopefully, they're authorized ministers of him, and to, to stand in his stead, literally stand in his stead and perform that work, okay? Having, having a minister stand there and perform an administration <clears throat> is really no different than having, it should be, let me put it that way, no different than having Jesus Christ stand there and perform that administration. Same with the confirmation, same with the baptism, same with any of the ordinances of the church, because they are standing for him in his place at that time. But 
you know, we better hope that it, that the Lord Spirit and the Holy Ghost is with that minister or those ministers as they're performing those things. Okay, so when we start taking these ordinances lightly, when we start taking these the act of faith lightly, we better be very, very careful because we're treading on, on very thin ice, and we're actually uh, disgracing our Lord and Savior when we do that. Okay, Raphael, do you have something? Assuming this is about faith, I'm kind of bad at stepping so. in on on things. Well, I'm you know, if you show up on time, you would know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's so around yeah. lecture seven. Yeah. Maybe I need to work on my irons in the fire. Yes, I, I totally get that. But go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say that, or remind, without faith, you know, everything in the world, everything about the world, God created. Mm -hmm done by faith absolutely and and everything that happens in our life if it's positive you know we we look and we hope that's faith mm -hmm. we, faith without faith there's nothing that can be done nothing and and faith is creative we can't create without faith we can't there's things we can do without faith, but it has no no fruit, no value, no growth. Yeah, exactly. Faith is truly powerful, and, and sure, it is it, absolutely. And, and like you said, it's by it's by faith that everything is is performed. Mm -hmm. See, I like to use the analogy. And you guys have heard this before of going out in the morning, and starting your car. Okay, we all know, right, that we go out and put the key in, turn the ignition, it's going to start. Well. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't. I've had that occasion happen, and uh, and and sometimes it's a little crestfallen. And it makes you a little crestfallen. It's like, oh, I know it should start. You know, I just changed the battery yesterday. I just did this. You know, and things of that nature. But but that that's the faith, right? We do even even those things that we know are going to occur and we know are true and right. We still perform those actions by faith. Correct. Okay, and again, it goes right back to where we were talking about, about the hosts of heaven there, uh, perform their works of wonder, majesty, and glory by faith. Even though they know they have that knowledge, you know, because they're in the presence of the Father, and, and they know that anything He tells them to do, or asks them to do, is uh, according to His will, and, and that it will happen, they still go out and actually perform the work, believing that it will happen. Did you have more? Yeah, people, the world has created this view of... of What's your what's your faith, your doctrine? Mm -hmm. Okay, and and I understand in lumping faith into that because without faith there's there's no doctrine. But people people think of a certain belief as faith, and so then faith begins to be taken lightly because well this is my belief or this is my faith, and and faith isn't really if if you read lectures on faith. Mm -hmm. The six categories it's broken down into is magnificent. And, and I sent you a video by David Barton mm -hmm. where he talked about catechisms right. in the history of our nation and how they used to teach our, catechize your child. And, and he, he took a scripture out of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I think it was the Old Testament where it said, raise up your child in the way he shall go. Right. And and he found uh, a place where you could, I forget what he did, but, but a word, and he was able to, to bring catechize into that frame of reference. Sure. And it said, catechize your child in the way he shall go. And so they used to, and our, our founders, they set it up, and our children were taught in this form of catechisms that we find in lectures on faith. And our, that's the only place I find that piece of history in this nation. Mm-hmm. Is what we have, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, and then moving on to five uh, C, and it states, "Faith is truly the first principle in the science of theology, and when understood, leads the mind back to the beginning, and carries it forward to the end, or in other words, from eternity to eternity." Okay. So everything is based upon faith. Okay. As faith then is the principle by which the heavenly hosts perform their works, 
and by which they enjoy all their felicity or happiness, okay? We might, or joy, I, I, I guess joy might be a better word, eternal joy. Uh, we might expect to find it set forth in a revelation from God as the principle upon which his cre creatures here below must act in order to obtain the felicities enjoyed by the saints in the eternal world, okay? So faith has to be a part, or it has to be the major part, I guess, in our understanding and in our practice. Okay, And then going back to what we call the principles of the gospel, uh, Hebrews chapter 6, it states, uh, starting with verse 1, verse one sorry, Therefore, not leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrines of baptisms, laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Uh, it, lays, it lists repentance and faith toward God in the first two categories. Okay, And those, those have to be intertwined, if you think about it. You cannot, uh, you cannot repent, truly repent, without practicing faith, right? Why repent if you don't have faith? You know, if I don't believe that there's something greater than me, then why would I be sorry for what I do to someone else? And you take, we talked about this before, you take atheism to its, its, its ultimate goal, okay? And it's all about me, 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 what I can get. And that you take it, again, to its ultimate end, its ultimate uh, uh, finish line. And if, if Raphael is something that I want, then as an atheist, I don't believe there's any punishment on the other side. I don't believe there's anything wrong. Why shouldn't I murder him to take what he has? Okay? Well, why would I be sorry for doing that? Okay? That's the ultimate, ultimate uh, end point of, of atheism, of, of basically the, the, the doctrine of Satan. If you, if you go that route, okay, is that there is nothing, uh, er, er, there is no ultimate punishment, there is no ultimate end uh, to the point where, where I can do whatever I want, I can be my own king, I can be my own god. That's the ultimate aspect of it, okay? Most atheists will tell you, no, 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 you can't harm somebody else, and they might go with property rights and things like that. It's anything that doesn't hurt someone else is okay to do, you know, that, that sort of thing. But if you take it to its ultimate end, it's all about setting yourself up as a god, and okay, as your own god, your own king, your own whatever, and uh, and so um, so you know we have to have faith in something else in order to effectively be able to repent, okay, and we have to be in repentance in order to exercise our faith. The, the two are intertwined; they go hand in hand. Okay, Raphael, you have more. That's the difference between true atheism and taught atheism. Taught atheism comes from the Church of Satan. True atheism, if you find one, he's generally probably not even going to be much of a sinner because Satan's probably. already got him, mm -hmm. and he's not trying for that soul. That's a good point. Okay. Um, I think that pretty much hits on everything there. Is there any, anybody else questions or comments before we move on? Uh, Steve in the back. I had a, some friends that were Jehovah's Witness for a long time, and yes. uh, one of them told me that their, their ba basic principle was do no harm to anyone else. Mm -hmm. If you did something that hurt somebody else, you had to go apologize to them right away. But that was their main principle okay. in their religion was that, that you do no harm to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that goes along with the, the two great commandments, doesn't it? You know, uh, someone help me out here. I know what they are, but I can't get them. To Thank you. Yes. And love thy neighbor as thyself, right? And so that goes right to the, you know, you got it in your mind, but you can't get it out your mouth. It just would not, the tongue wouldn't form. So, but yes, it, exactly. What's that? Yeah, <laughs> it's getting close, I tell you. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to make you run again, Ryan or Raphael. But yeah, I mean, that's, and that's a, that's a great principle, you know, but to be the main principle in, in a religion, um, and the main focus, that, that's terrific. But then it leaves so much else open, doesn't it? And you can do so much else that's against the doctrine of Christ as long as you don't harm somebody else. But you can do self-harm in, in a way. I mean, I guess they pretty much believe you shouldn't do that too. But you can, right? Go ahead. Um, there, was, there was, we'll say, three to four decades that major changes took place in this nation. Mm -hmm. 
where we stepped away from the way schooling originally was, the way our founders had things set up, and the changes that were made in not only schooling, but uh, when they took certain things out, even out of our church, mm -hmm. because maybe a leader in our church followed the way the world was going just to fit in. Right. And when they took out lectures on faith, that's what I'm talking about. But not sticking on that. But uh, in looking at the, the Jehovah's Witness, <laughs> I've, I've discovered that they... They go along with the UN. They believe in evolution. And if, if you look at them real close, you'll recognize the agenda that the left has going. Mm -hmm. That's part of their doctrine. Look, look at the doctrine of Jehovah's Witness. And it fits with not only the 100-year plan of the... Um, Well, what's that insurance company? Progressive. The progressive 100-year plan. It fits in with that. Okay. And it fits very closely. But Jehovah's Witness is one of two uh, organizations that were set up to catch people, Christians, and keep them in the belief of Christian, but make them go the way that the plan for this nation, what, they, what the left has planned. Okay. One is Jehovah's Witness, and the other one is Seventh-day Adventist. Okay. Um, I, I don't know enough about their doctrine. I'll be real honest, so I'll, I'll t take what you, you have to say. I, well, and, but I was going to say that fits in with Christian doctrine in general uh, anymore, is that you know, we look at the di different denominations, and I'm going to include the restoration branches in this when I say this, uh, maybe not to the extent of, of where other denominations are, but uh, we're becoming very liberal. And, and uh, at least the restoration branches are, are really, just like the RLDS church did before the break and continues to do now the CSC, in the CSC, we're adopting Protestant theology because we want to fit into the world. And that's what it boils down to. We, we preach a good sermon, you know, we talk a good talk in Sunday school many times, but that is the, 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 um, the path that I see so many of us on, you know, and it's becoming fewer and fewer in the branches who are really trying to hold the line and say, no, this is false doctrine, this is heinous, we're not going to allow it in, okay? And, uh, yeah, it's, and part of it's from being worn down. You know, we've got so much coming at us from, from every direction, and it's easy to get worn down. My sister, I probably shouldn't tell this, but, but I'm going to. Um, <clears throat> uh, most of you know my, uh, the rest of my family, parents and two sisters, still attend the Brick Church down here in the CSE Church. Okay? And uh, they, for the most part, they're not real liberal people. Okay? I know my mom, who, who has been ordained an elder, uh, couple decades ago. Anyway, she, she does not hold to the idea that, that homosexuality, the LGBT movement is okay. Okay. She, she's not real thrilled with open communion, you know, and accepting ministers of other denominations and things like the CSC is teaching that they should. Okay. So my sister, one of my sisters, anyway, we were talking to her over her house for a, a barbecue and, and, uh, we're, and Rachel and I were talking to her and she's getting real discouraged because she doesn't believe most of that, that liberal stuff. She holds the women in the priesthood, but she, most of the other aspects of that do, the doctrine of the church, she doesn't hold to. But she's getting hit from all sides. And there's so many people down there who he keep preaching about it, talking about it, and pushing it, that she's, she's uh, uh, getting to the point of thinking, well, does God really accept this? But I, I have such odd against it. It feels so icky, gross, however you want to phrase it, disgusting that I can't do it. And so she's getting to the point of, of, of losing her faith. Okay. And, uh, because she's one person trying to hold the line that she understands to hold. And I'm not making excuses for, her for staying down there, but you're just trying to hold the line that she's trying to hold. And it's very difficult. And we're finding ourselves in that situation here in the branches, the rest of the Christian denominations. And you see the majority of them, you know, being okay with the LGBT movement and accepting this in uh, and, and everything that goes along with it and just being a part of the world, okay? And this is very much 
Now, whether the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witness were set up specifically to do that, I'll, until I find out differently, I'll, I'll accept what you say. Um, and I don't mean that badly when I say that, but I don't know for sure. Oh, of course they won't. Who would? That would be stupid. It's all about deception. But, um, you know, but we see that infiltrating in the same ideas, infiltrating into other churches, other denominations, and even within our own denomination and the branches. Okay? So, uh, brothers and sisters, the doctrine of Christ matters. It matters more than you can really understand. Okay, and we can't just sit back and say, "Well, it doesn't matter." We should love everybody, and 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 everything's hunky dory with everybody else, and and just accept everybody for what they are. You know, we, we don't hate people because we disagree with them. That's not the point. But Christ does tell us to stand up for Him, not for each other. Right, Greg? You know, and I I think this goes without saying. You know, apostasy is the best tool that Satan has ever had. Sure. And, I mean, or I guess I guess that's the final blow of, of all of his tools working, I guess a person could actually accurately say. But we also have another problem um, when teaching our young mm -hmm. and, you know, when, when folks are baptized, uh, sometimes we stop ministering to them, stop teaching, stop going. And, I mean, imagine trying to, you know, fit into... You know, in the olden days, you know, if, if you were going to be one of the king's guard, you had to wear the certain uniform. If uh, and today, if you're going to be in the military, you got to wear your uniform. And they have different different uh, uniforms for each day of the week, or they might have four uniforms that they alternate through. And you've got to be in that proper uniform, otherwise you're in trouble. We have a problem with converting ourselves to this gospel. And to Jesus Christ, you know, we we really have a problem with that. We really have a problem teaching that. Um, we're afraid of telling people that no, you have to change who you are to to, you know, to be a part of this. That's exactly where I was going. Yes, keep oh, going. Okay. Well, keep, I, I, no, keep going. Keep going because that's that's exactly where I was going. With and this. and you know, there there were sects among the among the Hebrews, who when they were freed, who were not really. They were not partakers in the same covenant that many had made with, with, you know, the God of Abraham or with God, the Father. And that sect is the sect that made all the trouble, that started the trouble at Mount Sinai. Uh, that, that, that's the testimony I've heard from, from many times. And I don't know which, which scripture that, that talks a little bit about it. But that's, I, I, I would actually recommend, you know, looking that up. Uh, but that, but that's a problem amongst our uh, amongst our own people, as as a, as it is amongst everybody. Everybody is all about well, let's let's open our arms. And I'm all for being very open with people. Um, it's like Joseph Smith said, you know, if they won't accept our doctrine, you know, uh, let them accept our hospitality. Yes. But to join, you know, this is this is uh, this is a very special kingdom that you're joining whenever you're baptized into, and. I'm not. Uh, I'm not gonna not, you know sit here and knock my parents, but I think myself as well as I, th I think many of us probably feel this that maybe perhaps we weren't um, we weren't as informed as what we probably should have been upon our baptism. Perhaps we weren't as um, and e and even if you're baptized and you have time to learn, you know, uh, you know, the learning tends to stop very shortly after baptism or being welcomed into the fold. And you see a lot of people go by the wayside. Um, if we're supposed to build up a community and actually be the community, we have to literally convert. I mean, you can't stick a three-inch pipe and connect it to a two-inch pipe unless you have a converter. We have to we have to convert and be be what it is to the tool or whatever it is. And we keep bringing all these things, these ideas from the outside, and that seems to be you know I think we talked about this a few weeks ago. Our our truth, you know, that's the that's the phrase the liberals like to use. Tell me your truth, mm -hmm. you know what, you know, and everybody has their own truth. Right. And unless you're converted, you you become the fly in the ointment, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And uh, you know, you, you, your points are very well taken and very good. We we tend to be very good as, as a people, as, as a church. And, uh, you know, if someone shows some interest, really jumping on that and, and, and trying to get them to be baptized. 
And then we're really good about saying, oh, well, you're dunked, you're confirmed, you're here, you've made it. And, you know, the teaching doesn't really continue. The one-on-one -on -one teaching that doesn't continue many times. That's when it's needed the most is to really get them established and get a good foundation for those who are who are joining the church and because uh, you know we, we see the the testimonies the events that happen in church history where someone heard one sermon and wanted to be baptized and and then they you know they, they went forth and, and really changed their lives and that's something we need to explain to people when they're thinking about joining the church is a change is expected not just by us but by God, a change in your lifestyle is expected. You're not joining a church where, you know, if it fits your lifestyle, you know, you're A-OK. -okay. You know, you're, you're joining the church. You're joining, a, and he says, a, 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 I forgot how you phrased it, a special kingdom or something like that. And this isn't just especially, this is the kingdom of God. Okay? This is his, supposed to be his kingdom. This is his doctrine. This is his church. It's not ours. If it's a man-made church, we might as well disband. We might as well not even be here because we're doing ourselves and everyone else no good whatsoever. Okay, so yeah, your, your points are very well taken, and, and that's something we need to work on as, as, as a branch, as a group, as, as individuals. But the church as a whole is needed to work on for 180 years. Basically, is when someone does join that they need to continue to be worked with, and not just say, "Well, you're a member now, you got voting rights, and so on and so forth." And and uh, well, well, maybe. If we're, you're lucky, you'll get a priesthood visit once a year, you know, and sometimes you're very lucky if you get a priesthood visit once a year, you know, and uh, so your point is very well taken. We don't nurture very well, do we? And, and, and that falls upon the priesthood, but that also falls upon you as members for not asking too and not seeking those things out. You got to study. You got to ask questions. I've had one, one individual here in, in, in our congregation ask me, I think this is the third time this year she's asked for a priesthood visit. A, a, amen. I'm happy you do it. It's great. I love doing that. But sometimes I'll ask people if they want a priest to visit, and I know other, others have done that. And, no, no. Everything's fine. We're doing fine. So, well, I, you know, how are you going to learn if you're not getting that one-on-one -on -one attention? You know, you can come to church every Sunday, and you can learn some things, but that's not going to complete what you need. You know, that's not going to complete what I need. I learn just as much if not more, on a priesthood visit than what I'm trying to teach the individual or the questions I'm trying to answer. You know, it forces me to study, which is good. Sometimes I need a little, little kick, you know. Teaching Sunday school forces me to study, you know, again, because sometimes I need a little kick and I get a little lazy. I think we all do. So, you know, remember this. And, and even if you don't have any questions, even if you think everything's hunky-dory, ask for a priesthood visit. Get some people together. Just get together with them. Just have a chat. You know, talk about the kingdom of God. Share your testimonies. Share your experiences. Share your hopes and fears and dreams. You know, that's where we have to be with each other in order to really be that family that God calls us to be. Okay? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm on my soapbox again. I'll get down and we'll move on. I think Barbara had something over here. You know, when you were talking about your mom and your sister, mm -hmm. I, I thought that God said he will pour out his spirit. I know in my own family, I'm seeing it in a big way. Sure. And I, I would like to think that your mom, that her doubts on those things mm -hmm. are simply the Holy Ghost and trying to get yes, through to her. Yes, absolutely. We and talked so, about last yeah, week or the week before, right? And, and I would look at it that way and then just pray with that and go with that. Absolutely. Because the fact that she's not accepting these things, I think is a extremely good and I don't think it'll hurt her faith at all I think that God is reaching out to her mm -hmm. that would be the way I'd no I, I fully agree I haven't written them off if I sound like I've written them off that's that's not the case but you know it's but but you know when you have situations like that and I'm sure those of you have had that have that same situation in your families sometimes it's hard to get together positive. but yeah look at it positively exactly and that's what was with my sister you know I'm thinking okay so how can I step in how can I step in and help out the situation? And maybe I should be looking at how can God use me to help that situation? You know, that sort of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously. <laughs> and we don't say that enough, but obviously lots of prayer. All right, anyone else? Okay, where are we? Six, 
and seven. Let's see what we have going on here. Yeah, I was just trying to think. We we also need to have a conversation. So we got enough people here. Why don't we stop there for today and let's have a conversation about what we want to study next. We only got about ten minutes. Um, I know we got a few guests, so I apologize to you guys. But uh, let's, uh, as a congregation, we need to, or a Sunday school class, we need to talk about what we want to study next so I can start getting prepared for that. Um, I think I told you, let me get to my notes here. Last two weeks ago, I told you some of the things that, that had been suggested. Um, Okay, so and, and by no means is this the the ultimate list. We can come up with other things too. I don't I don't care. That's fine. Uh, one of them is Zion and, and the signs of the times. Uh, another is priesthood duties. So going through and specifically outlining according to scripture what what the priesthood duties are, what the elder, priest, teacher, deacon, uh, as, since that's what we have in our congregation, basically what their their duties are and what they're supposed to be doing. Going through the rules and resolutions of the church. Um, and specifically the question, what are they and are they still applicable today? We've done the lectures on faith. Well, we're almost done with the lectures on faith. Let me cross that out. Okay. And oops, what happened? Uh, another one is the church in our nation's history and the connection with Jerusalem. And, and I think in that one, I would also include maybe the Constitution and uh, how God brought that about and how it, how it fits in with the gospel. Uh, the Book of Mormon, actually going through line by line on the Book of Mormon. Oops. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Okay, so, so other, other suggestions? Uh, Raphael? Oh, I'm sorry. Waiting for Mike, I say, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, why we are who we are and our place in the world. Okay, meaning as a denomination? In, in the midst of the Jews and the Gentiles and okay. what our purpose is. All right. Who else? Rachel? In our place in the world. Yeah, bad. <laughs> I I vote for the the Zion one that you had on your list. Okay, Zion and signs of the times. Yeah. Okay, you're gonna give me a hard one, aren't you? So, yeah. Go for <laughs> it. No, that's fine, because that that is something that we as a congregation, as a people, need to study and need to uh, get a handle on. In the midst of uh, Jews. Okay, hold on a sec. Before you start speaking, Gentile. Okay, go. I, I would agree with the signs of the times in Zion also because okay. what I'm hearing is a lot of things from the Protestants mm -hmm. that they're talking like we like we talk, and God is working with them in a big way. Mm -hmm. Other people that really want to find out. Yes. So it seems to me that in our church, I I feel like I'm learning as much from some of the Protestants as I hear at church, and I think it would be good for us to be more under understanding of what's going on in the signs. So I would definitely think it would be for okay. the right time for that. Okay. For us. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, anyone else? Who else? Greg. I'm all right with doing the signs and times as well, but something else to put on the list for maybe you know another time is, um, you know, we talk about there being the 1260 years in the wilderness before 18 until up until 1830, and mm -hmm. you know at you know you, how you subtract that and you get like the birth of uh, Muhammad and uh, uh, you know I'd like I kind of like to go through all that, but I kind of like to almost have a Sunday school that's uh, or a, a class or series of classes that's directed at um, bringing about all these things up and and how to discuss all these facts to our Protestant friends, um, you know, talking about the restoration, why there's an apostasy. Of course, you know, we've got the pamphlets, the Reformers Dream mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but arming ourselves in a way that we are properly and capable, you know, capable of um, Convincing or at least you know debating all these facts as to who we are, what we are, and you know, and why 
why that why they stopped basically at like the Mount Sinai and Golden Calf. They they didn't move sure. on, you know, to to what they were supposed to be, what their what their very founders of their denominations were actually doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the, I kind of wouldn't mind having a series based on that and based on uh, proving the restoration, even even using the King James scriptures if we have to. Sure. To, to, and and because it's it's a little harder, or actually it's a lot harder, but you can do it. But again, it's been a while since I've delved into a lot of that, and I wouldn't mind trying to. I I don't know what you would title that, but you know. Well, I was thinking testifying to Protestants or something. Well, restoration know. apologetics is kind of what. There you go. What yeah. comes to mind? Yeah. Uh, so include using the King James Version. That would be a really good study, actually. Well, so is the Zion thing, not to put these two down. But, but that, would be, that would be an excellent one that's never been suggested before, actually. So those would be really good. Okay. Um, who else? And, and anything for the list. So, I mean, we can you know, keep adding to the list, too. Come on, nobody else? I would just agree with what he's saying. If we're a little bit familiar with King James, mm -hmm. then Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to witness. Okay, and uh, just just as a, an introduction to to that, I'm not saying we're going to start that next, but as an introduction to that, there's a, there's some books out there that you can read to uh, kind of get you prepped for that. One is one that the Price Publishing just Price, Price Publishing, sorry, just put out. It's called uh, Apostasy. You remember the title of that? Uh, Apostasy Restoration and something. Apostasy Refor Reformation uh, Restoration, and it's uh, by, was that Fry? Yeah, Evan Fry, and it was a series of articles printed in the Herald in 1934 or 36, I don't remember which, uh, that, that kind of goes through what Greg was talking about, that idea of there was an apostasy, and, and then it brings into uh, the, the history of the Restoration up through. Uh, the martyrdom and the reorganization. So that's that's a really good. I just finished that, and that was a really good one. Um, also, the call it evening. I would highly recommend that. The stories behind it's a little goofy, but the doctrine in there is very good. And I've used that for people who've asked questions before on things. I give them a copy of that, and it's very simple, basic, easy for them to understand. The other is um, uh, the magnificent work and a wonder by um, it's an, who. McGregor, I want to say Evans, and I knew that was wrong, R.C. Evans, but Daniel McGregor is another one. But it goes specifically to what Greg's talking about, about calculating the, the 1,260 years and then, then some other things, and how that works in not just with years of 365 days, but the Jewish year of 360 days and, 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 and lunar years. and things. It, It's a little in-depth, but it's really, really good read. And, uh, yeah, marvelous work. What did I say? Magnificent? Sorry, marvelous work and a wonder. Rachel, what else you got? <laughs> you shove it up our nose next time, Ryan. Geez. <laughs> we tried to throw it at me the first time. <laughs> it would hit me in the head, I am sure. Well, knowing you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was just going to say, uh, just as a as a thing, I, I, I like what Greg suggested. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a neat idea. And one thing that we were talking about here, the one thing we would have to be very, very careful with um, in that study is making sure that we know what we believe, that we, we would need to have a very Absolutely. hardcore understanding of what does the inspired version outline yes. that the King James leaves out because... So many folks take King James, just want to run with it, right? And I'm like, or, we have or one of the other translations, yeah. like the New New International. Yeah, I thought, I thought we, have to, we have so to know what we believe. In this church, not this branch per se, but in this church that use yeah. other translations and then the inspired version we to just, preach from. We have to know what we believe exactly before we go to the Protestants and start teaching, talking, exactly. and, and I teaching think that's about where King James. Going with it, but I, yeah. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, anyone else, Raphael? Another book to keep in mind up at prices is uh, the, oh. unbelievable differences between the King James and the Inspired Version. Okay, and it it 
goes There's through a number of those, a yeah. comparison with mm -hmm. a lot of different Bibles, not just the King yeah. James, but it's a good book. It's a little there's, book. There's one called uh, Three Bibles Compared, I think, and maybe that's the one you're thinking of. Maybe not. But no, there's it's one. just a little blue pamphlet. Okay, I'm thinking of a purple out. pamphlet, I think, that's you know, Three Bibles Compared or things like that. But yeah, we, we can use all those in, in that study. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Anything else? Okay. So why don't we... Just for ease for me, why don't we go with Zion and Signs of the Times? I think that'll be easier to get into, and then I can prepare better for the restoration apologetics ideal after that. They will, and that's why I think it, this doing Zion and the time, Signs of the Times will help us with our understanding and get us a really, really good rock-solid basis in what we believe before we jump into how to defend that. How to defend Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so anybody else have anything else before we, we end class? Okay, Greg, would you offer a prayer to end us, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the day and the many blessings, and I thank you for the, the nice rain that we have, and I thank you for your spirit that has been here, and I thank you for the knowledge that has been imparted unto us. I pray, Father, that as we go into the next service, that we will be reverent to you and be ready to worship you in truth and in spirit. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Greg. All right, everyone. If we could have all the priesthood meet in the back corner classroom, uh, including guest priesthood, if you'd like to attend, that'd be great. Thanks.